here in Drumcondra today to interview Anthony Coughlin about the Wolf Tone Societies. And could you tell me about the Wolf Tone Societies that were set up in the 1960s and what was the Irish Republican movement like at the time? Well, those are very large questions which I, I can't uh, answer in, 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 in too much detail because we can go on forever. But um, I was a member of the Wolf Tone Society in, in, in the 64, I think. So it went two phases. 1963 was the bicentenary of Tone's, uh, Tone's birth, and uh, a number of people got together. I wasn't one of them at all. Um, there was um, an eight inch McEwen, and the architect, there was Dick Roach, uh, and, uh, who walked with the Irish Independent. He was a friend of Sean Cronin's, who had been a leading light of the Republican movement. He also walked at the time with the Irish Independent. And they got together. A few of them, anyway, to, to, to hold a few series, a week, a week, week long series of lectures on, on, on Wolf Tone, on the bicentenary of his birth. And I remember going to one of these. The late Hubert Butler of Kilkenny was one of the speakers. And they called themselves the Wolf Tone Directory. <laughs> and then, you know, referring back to 1998, there was a, and there was a, a group in Dublin and in, in Belfast. And the Belfast group consisted of Jack Bennett and um, Harry White, I think. And, and, then uh, they Jack, Jack Bennett, who was a journalist, um, produced this thing, the Wolf Tone Today, uh, um, the publication of Belfast to mark the centenary, 12 page souvenir. But then the, after, the, uh, after this week's series of lectures was over, they were held in the mansion house. Um, I gather that they uh, thought that maybe we should set themselves up as a more long, long standing or long lasting thing. And they did, uh, because I see from the records I've got, and I've got most of the records, that in July 64 they adopted a, a new constitution, and they called it the Wilton Society from then on. So the society was basically what I would call a, a green think tank. Uh, it, it, it sought to uphold, uh, you know, a Republican point of view. Uh, um, and was it to sort of become more, to make the Republican movement uh, more radical? Was that the idea? More well, like no, O'Donnell and people like it, that, it, Gilmore? It, it wasn't formally part of the Republican movement in the sense that, that um, I'd say most of the members were, were, were independent people, not, not in either Sinn Féin or, or in any other group. But um, I see from the objectors I had here in the, the Constitution, with the support of the establishment in Ireland of a united independent nation, etc. To, to, to develop means of uniting the scattered, struggling national groupings so that their aim shall be aligned with the objective of a united Irish Republic. So an attempt to, to try and um, link together um, people who were <laughs> Republican minded, I suppose, and uh, who were, are on the left, um, and to provide some ideas that would meet the, the, the challenge of the time. It was basically a debating society or a discussion society. It, it, it didn't have a large membership. I said it adopted this new constitution and it then was formerly called the Wolf Tone Society and there were basically three branches, primarily two, the one in Dublin, the one in Belfast, there was a small group in Cork. And it continued meeting for some years after that, usually on, on a monthly basis. Typical meeting, it usually occurred in Inch McEwan's house in Marlborough, Marlborough Road. Might have just a dozen people. I doubt if the membership of the Dublin Town said it was never, ever more than 20 or 30. And there was a Belfast group somewhat similar. But what and it did was to link together a number of different individuals, um, mostly independent uh, nationalists like myself, who weren't in any organisation. Are, are some left-wing people, and we can leave the lady who passed through the society for a while, or, or attend a few meetings. Justin Keating attended a few meetings, others. But... Um, I'm sorry, were people like Cathal Goulding? Cathal Lloyd Johnson, were Cathal people Goulding like that? was in the original wrong? group that he was, a, he, had, he of course was the chief of staff of the IRA. I gather he was one of the original group who set up the Wotone Directory that organised this week-long series of meetings. I see that in the minute book, which I've got. Uh, and as I said, he was a friend of Sean Cronin, who was on, on, on the, with the, working for the Irish Independent. And, and I think the key people were, were in, what's his name, Dick Roach, Inch McEwen, and, and possibly Sean Cronin. That wasn't the original directory. They didn't come to, 
not, they weren't members, if that's the word, of the society after it set up, got it off its new constitution in 60, 60, what's the date here? July 64, that would be about a year uh, after the, um, the series of meetings in the, in the bench house that I mentioned. So, so there was this first phase in which Goulding was fed directly involved in, in setting up some this, this series of lectures on, on um, to commemorate uh, the tones bicentenary, as I said. But then a year after, you have this new constitution adopted. Uh, and I, I joined, I think, in, in the second year, in 64. I joined, when I had become a society, I became a member of it. And I became assistant secretary, I think, I wrote down the day, assistant secretary in, uh, in 65, yes. And could you tell me about some of the people involved, like people like, is it Fred? Heatley? Well, that, Jack Fred, Fred Heatley was a member of the Belfast Society. Okay. The, yeah. the leading person, the, I suppose one of the key people in Belfast was Jack Bennett, who, who was a journalist in the Belfast Telegraph, a Protestant background. A younger person, he'd been the, the Northern Ireland CP, he was in England then, he was a close friend of Desmond Greaves. Desmond Greaves just stayed with him in, in Belfast when Desmond went to Belfast. But, um, and he was right, uh, there wasn't one thing that Jack Bennett uh, did, uh, was to write the uh, weekly Claude Gordon column in the Sunday Press. It was a very influential paper at the time, the Northern Edition of the Sunday Press, which was the Sunday Edition of the Irish Press. And uh, under his, uh, the name Claude Gordon, he wrote this very full column, almost half a page usually. There had a lot of influence on nationalist thinking, uh, I think, during the 60s, uh, which has somebody should write a thesis about it. It's hard to measure the impact of that, but I have little doubt it had a fair amount of influence in encouraging people to take up the civil rights issues when, the, when, the, when those came on the scene in the middle and later 1960s. But Jack Bennett, as I said, was the editor, at least, of this um, Wolf Tone. It's only a one-off a one thing, you know, a one-off commemorative issue produced in 1963 on the bicentenary itself. Fred Heatley was another independent, uh, nationalist, independent Republican, um, um, who, who was interested in local history, and uh, and he was in the in in the Belfast group, and he later got involved in the Civil Rights Association in '67. But that was a few years later after after the Civil Rights Association was set up. And uh, I, I don't didn't then um, well, no, Professor Dolly. He, he was a chap in Queen's University. He was a kind of independent liberal 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 nationalist, I suppose. Um, he, they were in the Belfast Society, but the Dublin was, was more, 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 more active, I think, and more in the sense that it was it re met regularly, and it sought to initiate a number of things and are publicised and draw attention to a number of issues. Um, I mean, that whole location of public meetings uh, on, uh, for example, well, the um, the thing I was particularly interested in was was the. Um, Free rose have a free tra free trade agreement with Britain. Remember, Ireland applied to join the EC in 1961, along with Britain, and then De Gaulle vetoed um, British uh, and, in effect, Irish membership uh, during during the 60s. And, and then the thing was revived after De Gaulle's death in in, in, in 69, and, and um, then the application was revived in 71, and Britain and and and, and Ireland and Denmark joined the EC in 73. But um, in uh, 65 you had the Anglo-Irish Free Trade Agreement, which was a kind of uh, initiative that uh, the Mass and company and, and initiated uh, in the middle 60s. And um, uh, some of us were cri very critical of, of, the, of, the, of the sudden lurch to free trade. Uh, and so the Wilton Society set up a, uh, produced documentation critical of the Anglo-Irish Free Trade Agreement and held a couple of public meetings, for example. That was one thing they did. They support a number of other initiatives, like save, save, Saving the Taylor's Hall, you know, the, the, yeah. which was the campaign to save the Taylor's Hall, which was eventually saved. Um, they had public meetings on the Irish language, there was controversies about the Irish language. Uh, there was a group called the Irish Language Freedom Movement, which I remember um, we, 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 we had some interaction with. Um, and things like Dublin House and Action Committee, would they support yes, the things well, like that? Well, I think they probably held a public meeting on housing and, and would have interacted with some people in the Housing Action Committee. And uh, I suppose the most of them So in a sense, what, what was... What was all sadly consisted essentially of, uh, of largely people who were on a line, put on a, at least they're not organisationally involved in, in, in any of the public organisations. They weren't on Sinn Féin or the IRA. There would have been a few exceptions, but most of them, most of the members of society would have been independent-minded 
floating kidneys, if you like, of nationalist and republican outlook. And, um, and, uh, but they were taking up issues which, and of course the commemorations of, of, of um, 1960, 1916, 50th anniversary, that was 1966, and then there was the Connolly commemoration, centenary of Connolly's birth in 1968, and so these were, and, and then there was the, um, the support for the cooperative movement in the west of Ireland, you had Father McDyer, in Glen Column Kills, uh, setting up the cooperative movement, cooperative movement then, and, and, and there was a support group in Dublin, Ethna Viney, for example, who married, later married Michael Viney, the Irish Times journalist, she was in the Woodall Society for a period before she got married. So the, the Society would try and encourage support in Dublin for, for these initiatives, but it was for it was a modest group. And occasionally the pubs had public meetings, but uh, and you know, a debate you, uh, or something. Uh, and uh, then sometime in the middle 60s, it brought, brought out an occasional bulletin, which would circle to the, the media and to uh, in, in nationalist, republican, or left wing circles so-called Turish bulletin, and uh, it, so basically it was seeking to, um, to, to encourage um, a com a coming together, you might say, of Republicans and, and people on the left in the Labour Party or the Socialist left-wing movement, Communist movement or whatever, but I suppose it, its general influence was that it encouraged the politicization of the Republicans at that time, but in the sense that, uh, as you know, in the 1960s, the, the uh, Republicans had uh, had uh, drawn, uh, ended the 1956-61 border campaign and they were seeking to become more relevant uh, and uh, so the only way they could, could become relevant was to take up political issues and the Wonton Society was quite independent, uh, uh, pioneered a number of issues of which I suppose that the one most relevant down here would have been the criticism of free trade and the Anglo-Irish Agreement, and later on the membership of the EEC. Of course, they were told that it was against the EEC right throughout. They said this was a dormant issue through much of the 60s. And then later on in the north of Ireland, in the civil rights movement, it encouraged the idea of taking up civil rights and, um, and played a part in the genesis, the Belfast group particularly played a part in the genesis of the Civil Rights Association. And I was particularly interested in that because I've been involved in the conversation in England. It was very much influenced by Desmond Greaves, who, in my opinion, was the person who, thought up the, who first thought up the idea of a civil rights movement as the way to um, subvert a unionist majoritarianism in the north of Ireland. And, um, as you know, the conversation was agitating against these issues of discrimination against nationalists in, in Britain all during the 60s and indeed earlier. But uh, I was Dublin correspondent for the Irish Democrat. Uh, which was the um, monthly paper of the association right throughout from 61 up until it ceased publication 40 years later. And uh, and I was her personal friend of Greaves, of course, and, and was pushing civil rights myself quite independently. I mean, I wasn't in either Sinn Féin or the IRA, but I was pushing civil rights as an issue through personal contact with the, some of the people that, you know, mentioned, you mentioned Goulding, McGuller, Thomas McGuller, people like that. And and, um, and of course the Belfast group uh, helped to in '67. They, they, they took a, there were a number of meetings which are fairly well known, which led to the foundation of the Civil Rights Association in January '67. The Northern Ireland Civil Rights Association, which was to some extent modelled on the British um, National Council for Civil Liberties, and had the novel idea, if not novel at the time idea of if, if you were British rights were British citizens, if the, if the people in the North were citizens of the United Kingdom, they should be treated the same as other citizens of the United Kingdom. And of course they weren't because, um, as you know, the convention was that matters devolved to the Stormont Parliament could not be raised in Westminster and the Stormont uh, government, a majority unionist government, uh, presided over widespread abuses in, in, in gerrymandering of constituencies, discrimination, the allocation of housing and jobs and so on. So the Civil Rights Association had an initial program of, you know, opposing those those measures. And, uh, and so did the, with the rise of the civil rights, was that sort of the end of the Wolf Tongue Societies then? Did no, no, they, no. Did uh, most of them people kept come out to this? In the north of Ireland, the, thing yeah. that, the, the Belfast Wolf Tongue Society in particular, and encouraged to some extent by myself and, one, and the Dubliners, because they, they interacted, 
was to take up civil rights and, 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 and encourage the, the support, the fact that the Polto Society had pushed it and encouraged the Republicans in the North to, 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 to go along with the idea of a civil rights approach. And the first civil rights marches, there was some of the local Republicans steward of the marches, for example, the Coal Island to Dungannon March and so on. So that was a political initiative. There were other elements came together, of course, in setting up the Civil Rights Association. There were the radical, um, some of the left-wing um, trade unionists in, in, in Belfast. Uh, Betty Sinclair, after all, was the Secretary of the Belfast Trades Council. And the well-known member of the of Northern Ireland C CP. And then there were the some workers in the Draftsman's Union in the shipyard who also were, um, were um, they were generally on the left but, and, and a Protestant background. But they took up civil rights as well. So I think the Civil Rights Association was kind of coming together of the left-wing trade unionists on the one hand, and the politicising Republicans on the other, with various uh, various people who were neither neither one or the other, uh, you know, John D. Stewart and Dolly and so on. That was in Belfast, but down the south, the main impact, the main influence of this, what don't say to say, would I, I, I would say was in its criticism of, of um, uh, initially of the Anglo Irish Free Trade Agreement in 1965, and then its opposition to the um, move to join the EEC. Which, as I said, was initiated in '61, but uh, became a live issue again in '69, and culminated in the referendum in '72, which led us to joining the EEC. And the Wilton Society said, "This the EEC is now going to be a big issue. This is from '68 9 onward." So they set up a, a separate group, the Common Market Study Group. So it was some members of the Wilton Society set up this Common Market Study, also quite a modest little group, where it began producing argumentation and arguments against joining the EEC. So I would say, in the, in the wider run of things, the main influence of the Wilton Society, as I said, was quite a small group, a kind of green think tank, as I said earlier, was how it encouraged uh, Republican nationalist participation in the civil rights movement in the North, uh, uh, from, in, from 66, 67, 68, and NICRA was founded in 67, the first civil rights march was 68, and the South, the um, opposition to the EEC, which of course encompassed uh, not just nationalist Republicans, but also the Labour Party and um, and, 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 and the Trade Union Congress, because the Irish Labour Party and the TUC, the Irish Congress of Trade Unions, um, opposed Irish members of the EC in 1972, uh, in the 1972 referendum. And uh, the, the uh, Kalmarka Study Group, which was kind of hived off from the association, um, I, w I was joined secretly in it of with the late Raymond Crotty. But Raymond Crotty well, hadn't been in the Cotton Wilton Society. He, was, he came together with this new group. And Crotty and I were the uh, secretaries of the um, of the Common Market Study Group, which then in turn gave rise to the Common Market Defence Campaign, as we called it. It was a kind of umbrella group that provided argumentation and documentation for um, for the different elements in, in, in the referendum, the 72 referendum, and deals closely with the Labour Party and uh, ICT, I can't the trade unions in, in that. But you might, you might trace the, the genesis of these two uh, political initiatives, which uh, are quite important in their way, the, the civil rights movement in the north and, and, and the Eurocritical movement in the south, to some extent to the Wilton Society. You know, but then, then it did a number of other things, but it, it was a modest group. You know. So when, they, when Sinn Féin that moved to the left in the 60s, the Wolf Dance Societies must have had a Great influence. Yeah. They, don't, they were pretty left wing issues. They were the only issues that were around. Uh, but uh, because I remember in the seventies, uh, the referendum against joining the EEC, official Sinn Fein. Some of their pamphlets were very good. Um, so would they? They must have sort of yeah. almost copied the uh, I, I mean, type yeah. of documents that you They'd had. Take yeah. The, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, to myself and one or two others, and Crossy produced all the key argument on the, on, the economic, on the economic side, more or less. I would think. Oh, Rory Roberts, who was secretary of the Congress of Trade Unions, uh, was, was himself very vehemently against joining the EEC. And when I went to Gaul, Vita in the 67, he said he threw his hat in the air. Uh, but the argumentation was largely produced by, by, by our group. But well, in this case, it was the Common Market Study Group, though, which, as I said, had the initiative for that, to some extent, came from, from the group in the Wilton Society, the individuals of the Wilton Society, myself particularly who were interested in, in that issue. And were people like Padre O'Donnell and um, G 
Gilmore, would they, they were all quite old at that time. They were veterans, of course. Yeah. And, and were they involved in any way in this type of stuff? In, in the sense that they spoke occasionally at, at occasional public meetings. And said they would don't say they, maybe two or three times a year might have been a public meeting on some issue of the day. And I do remember uh, George Gilmore being invited and giving a talk on republicanism today and so on, and harking back to the 30s. And, but these were veterans. Uh, and it's a whole part, you might say, all, all that had an influence on politicizing the Republicans, you know, encouraging them to take up political issues and, you know, because of the EC in the South and support for the civil rights movement in the North were essentially political issues. Well, they, I don't think they were in principle particularly left-wing as such. I mean, people on right and left could be critical of the EC and similarly in relation to civil, civil rights in the North. Uh, but um, then, of course, you had the tragedy uh, of the Republican split in or, uh, in '69 or '70 as a result of the way the thing blew up in the North, and then because they the, uh, they divided and so on, and you had the provisions and officials founded in, 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 in January '70. You had that split, and yet both of them opposed the EEC opposed for a long time. The, they opposed the EEC. Yeah. The, ref the referendum didn't come until yeah. two years later, yeah. in '72. But the two groups were opposed to Europe. They, they did oppose it in yeah. the, the actual referendum when it came. Yeah. But, because, of course, the, the United Republic movement had been opposed to EC membership from its initiation in 61. 61 was an initial application to join, as well as it was put in abeyance all during the 70s, it only revived in 72. Well, in 1970 and then 71, and, and then we had the referendum in 72. But. Um, it, it wasn't a big issue during the 60s. What was uh, perhaps an uh, important issue down here was the anglo irish Free Trade Agreement, which was meant to prepare this state, move the state towards the free, free trade, which of course was one of the concomitants of the, uh, of, of the EC. But the, the one side of there was, there was the, the nearest analogy would be kind of something like the Fabian Society, which had a lot of interest in the Labour Party. There was, there was a quite small in number, the British Labour Party, I mean, in that it produced ideas, memoranda, and, uh, State press statements, you know, and this bulletin, internal bulletin, Turish, number seven, which I've got here, this thing, um, set out, uh, this is August 66, to set out the way in which a civil rights movement might be, might, might uh, help to uh, destabilize uh, majority, uh, majoritarian unionism in the North. You know, which it did, in which the it end. did. Yeah. Um, but that, Various, the story of the civil rights movement is a bit complex, but it's just, the said there was one influence on it. As I said, there were other influences as well, but um, the Belfast trade union element and so on. And the influence of Desmond Greaves from in Britain, but uh, on particular individuals. And so Desmond Greaves, did he have, was he Irish descent? Or was no, he, he was born in Liverpool, but uh, he was born in Liverpool. His people, he had some family connection with the north of Ireland, but he okay. was, he had also Welsh connections. I suppose he, he never made much money. He was regarded as Irish or British, but he certainly grew up in Britain, certainly. And uh, but he 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 he, he of course was uh, was in the college station for years and seeking to interest British Labour in reforms in the North of Ireland. And so that happened eventually to some extent, particularly after things blew up here. There was a fairly strong left wing movement in British Labour circles pressing Harlan Wilson when he came to office in '64 to do something about the North. And um, so Wilson was under some pressure from his more left wing element. And the colonization of Britain had been working on that for years, and I was active in the colonization my three years in Britain, being '58 and '61. And would this be people like Tony Benn? Well, people well, around? That yes, time. well. Not so much the North. Ben didn't take up the North of Ireland very much. There were Stan Orme, would have been well known, mm. Leslie Lever, Paul Rose, they were British MPs. Ben would, would I suppose, would have, but it was never an issue that Ben made an awful lot of, but he would have supported, I suppose, the reforms, yes. Um, there were generally left wing Labour, there were a whole lot of them. And they were pressing Wilson for reform. So when the civil rights marches began in 68, uh, Wilson was under pressure from the civil rights march in the north and wanted reform and he, uh, quite a strong left wing, largely left wing, but not entirely, so there were some liberal elements 
in, in his own party who were pressing him to do something about the North. And, and he in turn put pressure on O'Neill to introduce reforms. He didn't do so quickly enough or radically enough. And that I think is one of the reasons it blew up. Because the British government didn't want to touch, touch change from, until they were really forced to do so. And then 1970, yeah. the Conservatives came back to power. Th they did. And of course, that was it, pretty much I mean, yeah. the British government uh, stood over the discrimination in North Ireland for 50 years. The colonization adopted a new constitution in 1955, which committed them to, in Britain now this is, to, um, to agitate, agitate even in, mainly in labour and trade union circles and, and to try and uh, get a form in the north. And uh, when I was in Britain in 1958-61, we got over half the parliamentary Labour Party to sign telegrams to Brookport calling for the release of the internees in the Crumlin Road, Belfast. These are the people who have been interned, some of them for a couple of years, without charge of trial in Belfast because of their involvement or latest involvement in the uh, in the IRA, IRA border campaign. The campaign was now over, there were a couple of hundred people still in prison. But that could be done uh, under the transferred power that had been given to the Stormont regime. But those issues couldn't be raised in Westminster. So there was this happy convention which prevented these issues being raised in, in the House of Parliament, in, 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 in the House of Commons. And the conversation was battering its head against that for years. And people tried to say, you should do something. Well, nothing was done. And then the tinder piled up. And someone sent it. It went in fire or blew up or whatever metaphor you use in, in, in 1969, you know. So it sort of falls very too little and too late. Or too late, anyway. But, uh, so the one told said, uh, it was just, it had that influence. And then, it's, it's records are available. I got them. And I put them in the National Library due course. Uh, and um, people can read, read, read the minute book and read, read the documentation for themselves. So you were talking about the uh, Economy Association, was that a much bigger? The Association <coughs> would have a few hundred, hundred members, a few hundred members, but had a newspaper, the Monthly Irish Democrat. And when I was in England in 58 to 61, it was, the monthly sales would have been several thousand, and one occasion went up to 10,000. Modest, I suppose, yeah. but they were just sold entirely around the pubs in the Irish community. It did not. Smith's, the booksellers didn't take it, you know, it was, it was sold around the, around the pubs by, uh, by committed people and the Irish Democrat, uh, which was filed as available online and so on, it had quite a bit of influence in, uh, in, in, in encouraging conversation groups to lobby their, trade, their MPs or raise issues in, the trade unions, in their trade unions about, um, about the North. I mentioned uh, earlier that is, uh, 61, they had the, we, the association organized these telegrams to to Lord Brook were assigned by Labour, over half the parliamentary Labour Party eventually assigned them, urging to release the internees. The, this was in 61, six or, six or seven years before anything happened in the North, anything blew up in the North of Ireland itself.